Um, thank you very much. Um, can you see the screen well? Thank you. But thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this paper. It's a pleasure to be virtually in Santiago and to keep collaborating with the Central Bank of Chile and the IDB with whom uh, we have a long-term relationship. And it's a pleasure to get to read uh, George's paper. We talked uh, briefly in a conference in La Sea, the last conference I attended before the pandemic, and, and it's good to see you again. So uh, as uh, George was presenting, uh, this is a paper about foreign bank currency hedging and the impact on current um, covering interest parity. So, Thank you for the opportunity to revisit the CIP literature, which I had seen for the first time like 30 years ago. Uh, so I, I also he heard uh, some presentations from mostly the uh, BIS and also for the IMF. I started looking at this issue of um, deviation from covering interest parity that uh, they were supposed to work well, but then they noticed around the global financial crisis that there were deviations and these deviations happen in, in developed markets. So they were very surprised. So the issue captured uh, significant attention in the recent years. As I said, there are a stream of papers from uh, the BIS. Uh, you see sometimes similar data, sometimes other data. There are also papers uh, at the IMF, and there is also the well-known paper by Wendy Du et al. in the JF in 2018 that look at covering interest parity in developed countries. And there are other papers as well. And I think that the evidence in general tries to look at persistent deviation of covering interest parity, as Georgia mentioned, even for very liquid developed markets, which is surprising. And they try to first document those deviations and then try to look at what factors might be affecting those uh, deviations. Um, and what uh, Georgia does in this paper is she looks at the burden of emerging economies as she clearly explained, and then she use, uses cases for uh, more data for the case of Mexico, which is another liquid uh, foreign exchange market to look at uh, what is going on using nice data that on bank positions. And, and she can also look at the actual foreign uh, currency hedging rather than estimates. And then uh, Georgia is also able to look at disentangle uh, the positions of the global banks versus uh, other banks and see what effects they might have. So the, the paper is ambitious. So there are several questions. I mean, there is a big, big question, but several related questions that the, the paper tries to address whether resident bank hedging widen CIP deviation. My understanding is that the, the evidence says yes. There is a mixed evidence of, um, of arbitrage constraints. There is evidence that the foreign counterparty can of partially offset the, the effect from the resident banks. Um, and there is also evidence that resident banks hedging net of foreign hedging has an effect. Um, and, and that effect is uh, driven by the foreign subsidiaries of global banks, uh, subsidiaries located in, in Mexico. So that's kind of a, all the things that the, the paper uh, studies and, and, and Georgia uh, finds. So in terms of terminology, I think that it might be useful when I went back to the basic was is CIP. Uh, and how the foreign banks might ex exert some pressure on this. So basically, this uh, the deviation, uh, which we can call B, the basis, is the difference between the interest rate that one can get. Let's say that I have a dollar, I put the dollar at interest rates uh, are a uh, star. So in period M, I get the, uh, the return one plus R, or I can put it, I can have a dollar exchange it for uh, pesos in the local sport market. So it's pesos per dollar at uh, the S. Uh, this uh, S, I put it at uh, interest rates, uh, at the local interest rates, RTM. And also, um, I, but in order, because I started with dollars and exchange to pesos, in order to hedge my position and to have this cover. I buy future uh, dollars back 
in the for in the future in the forward market, uh, which is the F. Uh, and then those two things uh, in principle should be equal if there are no transaction costs, no barriers to arbitrage, etc., no counterparty risk. Uh, so barring all the other factors, these things should equalize. But the, what the literature tends to find is that there is a negative basis. Uh, so usually the local currency interest rate uh, tends to pay more, even after you uh, hedge that position. So it pays more to put the money in Mexico uh, and then buy the dollar forward than put it in a dollar uh, interest rate. So what the, uh, Georgia does is uh, she relates this uh, deviation, this basis, to measures of resident bank hedging. And mostly, aside from the Mexican data that she has some uh, nicer data, she looks at a bank's assets minus liabilities. So foreign access minus liabilities. And why banks might affect this basis? Uh, so basically, if you start from a, a condition of parity, so the, the top equation, left-hand side, is what you get in the, uh, the dollar interest rate uh, is equal to what you get in the peso interest rate after doing all the currency transactions. Uh, what banks, if banks are uh, having, usually what they do in Georgia documents, is they have more foreign assets than foreign exchange assets than liabilities. So they are long in dollars. So in the future, what banks will need are pesos. So if banks are in Mexico, they have a lot of uh, foreign exchange assets or so a lot of dollar, they say dollar loans, and they might have a few uh, dollar deposits. They need, they need to give pesos back, but they have long dollars. So what they need is to buy do, uh, pesos in the future. So they need to liquidate the future dollars that would receive from the assets uh, today. So what they'll do is they put pressure in the forward market. They buy uh, pesos in the forward market, and that tends to appreciate the peso. Uh, and here is, is peso per dollar. Uh, so this uh, right-hand side will tend to increase. So the pressure from the banks, when the banks have long dollar assets and they need to buy uh, pesos is to uh, create this negative basis, or, or if there is, we start with the negative basis to begin with, begin with then they will uh, widen the basis. If we have banks that have the other position, that they are long pesos and they need to buy dollar back, they will put pressure in the opposite direction. So that's basically the mechanism that uh, George has in mind to try to understand why uh, this unhedged position from banks might generate the widening in the current interest parity. So that's what the paper um, is basically studying. So there could be other intermediaries. I mean, one might think usually, and that's something that the literature, uh, Georgia mentioned, the literature mentioned that could be other intermediaries. Always when we study one financial intermediary, whoever, whichever that intermediary is, we wonder why uh, that intermediary has such a big effect in the market. We tend to find in many uh, instances that uh, some intermediaries are pretty large. And when they go and buy, there is no one else on the other side, even though in principle, they could pre be pretty large. In Mexico, we have large institutional investors, foreign investors. So it's not clear why we have banks moving the market so much, but uh, the evidence suggests that uh, that might be the case. Uh, but that's a question that we still uh, have in, in, in our minds when we look at some intermediaries. And the other, um, the other uh, question is why banks remain with unhedged positions uh, even after accounting for derivative? Uh, why they have these, are they are long, for example, long uh, dollars uh, and they remain uh, in that position because for banks, it should be very, fairly simple to uh, undo the mismatch. They can change the lending rates or the deposit rates that they take, and, and they can have a, a, a hedge position. So it seems that banks are, for some reason, are choosing to have that position, uh, and they are not unwinding it. Um, so if the banks are choosing it, 
I wonder, so that leads me to the question of to what extent this mismatch is really generating pressure for banks to hedge it because they, we see that in, in equilibrium, they, they, remain, they remain in that place. So that's something that uh, by looking at the paper, um, some questions that came to mind. The other couple of questions that uh, came to mind also regarding the empirical analysis is uh, Georgia mentioned uh, she studies uh, the pressure from the bank on deviation from covering interest parity. And there is this issue, I mean, the correlation is well documented. Uh, Georgia also does some IV analysis uh, to try to tackle the issue of endogeneity. But I mean, when started reading the paper, it comes very clearly that also deviation from covering interest parity should play a role in the unhedged position of the banks uh, because um, in investors will have different incentives to put money into, let's say, pesos are, are, are paying, I pay, pay much more, to have a, an incentive to have pesos ready to, to dollars in the market uh, because you make more money. So the, the CIP will have an effect on what banks are received, for example, as deposits. And that will affect the liability of, of the banking sector. Uh, so Georgia tries to look at the identification by look, using lags of the variables. Um, and she does um, uh, tries to see whether that instrument is valid. Um, but I, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to look at uh, exogenous variation through just lag values. So it would be nice to look at some actual exogenous demand pressure that we can observe from banks that then uh, uh, might exert some movement in the CIP uh, rather than this uh, difference between assets and liabilities that, um, I mean, it's an equilibrium condition more, more uh, or I interpret that more as an equilibrium condition than, than an exogenous variation. The other, the other question that came to mind, maybe is deep down in the paper, but I didn't find it uh, well, is the maturity mismatching. We have these assets and liabilities. Assets and liabilities uh, at banks are at different horizons. Uh, sometimes they have um, loans, long-term loans, or they have, might have uh, bonds that are usually five, 10, uh, 15 years, 20 years, and the foreign currency hedging is usually uh, short-term. When we look at currency market the, the futures, is, it's at the monthly level. So, so doing the, 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 the matching between assets and liabilities and then looking at how it affects the CIP at the much shorter horizon, uh, a, that might create a, a kind of a mismatch between the maturities on the one side and the other side that might explain some of the differences or, or could explain. I'm not saying that it does explain, but I think documenting that we are doing the matching well um, is relevant uh, because of the different maturities that these contracts entail. The other thing that it worries me a little bit is that as I see it is the, the Mexican data is the nicest data because the other data is more, it's fine, but it's kind of um, more, more coarse and it has been used a little bit with a Borio and other, and other people, but it's not as defined. So Georgia has good access to good data from Mexico. Uh, but one caveat, as Georgia kind of alluded, is that uh, we have a short time period, only monthly data, so it's 53 observations, and we try to obtain all the, all the statistical power from those 53 observations with a lot of variables added, et cetera. So, so having more statistical power would be nice. Uh, so extending the data or having more high frequency data or doing something that can get around that problem. I think that would um, make the, the results um, probably stronger. And Thank when you, discussing the results- Less than two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when discussing the result, also it would be useful to highlight both the statistical and economic significance of the point estimates. Uh, so suggestion, if I were to kind of uh, to have a, some unsolicited advice that I was put in this uh, uh, role of discussion. The paper is rather long, a um, lot of narrative, et cetera. I will try to shorten it and try to avoid redundancies, focus it much more. 
add details. Some parts have a lot of discussion, but that other parts are lacking. Some of the details of the analysis. So add more details where they are needed and, and avoid repetitions that would make the paper um, um, easier to read and add more analysis when needed. And also think about what the contribution to the literature is and what the findings of the, of the paper are related to the literature and, and link more closely the, the, the flow, the first question to, to, to the different findings, which you do in part, but I think it's a little bit, um, doesn't come like, as you presented, it came very late in your presentation here and in the paper also becomes very late. So present, uh, go, go straight to the results, which are the core of the paper. So the final thoughts, I don't have much time. So in terms of how I see the literature, I revised, I went to the literature, revised what the CIP is, and then I went back to where the literature might stand and where it might go forward. I think that the literature might move in different directions. One is the importance of the different factors determining the CIP deviations um, using micro data and identification. And this paper uh, plays an high role in this effort, try to get good data identification and try to, to determine what is driving deviation from CIP. There is also the question of the general equilibrium effect. So what? I mean, we have this deviation from cover interest parity, who cares? I mean, the Georgia point is that the banks might be uh, putting some pressure and dislocating the market such that other actors like corporates might want to hedge and, and the fact that the banks uh, kind of uh, generating a disequilibrium condition in the market is generating a spillovers on, on corporations. That could be the case, but banks also play some useful role. So the counterfactual is if you don't wanna have banks, I mean, banks also are useful uh, and they might have uh, some, uh, um, some good role in the economy. Even the foreign banks that you study that deviate in the, this uh, CIP. And also at the same time, we don't know the extent of the spillover to, the co to other sectors. So, so try to understand the general equilibrium effects, which I, I understand is beyond the scope of the paper, but that's where I think part of the literature might go. And the other thing that we might want to think about is the policy response, because we are at the Central Bank of Chile, and just to conclude, so whether the, the, if there is some type of spillover and negative externality, then whether the bank, the central bank, for example, can play a counteractive role to uh, shrink this deviation from CIB uh, if there is a dislocation in the market, and whether the supervisory agencies might impose stricter rules so banks are not for example, in this case, and hedge such that they don't put pressure in the CIP. So there is a role for policy action to the extent that there are um, um, effects that the economy, I mean, uh, calls for. And that's something that uh, will be subject for discussion. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>